Today, we're joined by Roger Severino. He's the director of the Office of Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He has had a, a long uh, career and resume. He's been served as the director of the DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society uh, in the Institute for Family, Community, and Opportunity at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, before that, uh, he was a trial attorney for seven years in the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, where he enforced the Fair Housing Act, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, and Title II and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, these are all some pretty heavy responsibilities. So welcome, Roger, and anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, no, I'm glad to be on and here to support American Kidney Health. It's a presidential priority as well as a priority of the Secretary. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. Um, members of the American Society of Nephrology have greatly appreciated the focus that's been placed on, on kidney uh, ever since the President did issue the executive order last July 2019. We, re we remain committed to those um, priorities and are very welcoming of the Secretary and the President's support. So. Some of our members may not have, you know, dealt with the Office of Civil Rights as much. Uh, can you give us a little bit of the background about your office and, and what your responsibilities are at HHS? Certainly. We have a very proud history. We're at the forefront of desegregating the hospitals in America after the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and we try to keep that tradition strong into the present day and have expanded our portfolio to go beyond race, color, and national origin to include sex disability, age, religion, and the exercise of conscience. Those are protected classes in health and human services. So we have three divisions. One is our civil rights division, uh, which covers race, sex, national origin, disability. We have a health information privacy division as well. So we also cover HIPAA uh, because an important part of access to health care is making sure that your information is kept confidential and the integrity of the information is preserved against hackers. Um, we're all about increasing access to healthcare, and HIPAA is an incredibly important part of that. And the newest kid on the block is our Conscience and Religious Freedom Division. This was launched a couple years ago after the president issued an executive order on religious freedom, saying that we have to vigorously enforce this fundamental human right. And we launched a division dedicated to that particular issue in health and human services. Whenever you have life and death issues, the, the question of conscience, religious freedom comes to the fore. I want to, want to make sure that those rights are uh, equally respected as, as every other civil right. So we leave no right uh, is left behind. That's, that's quite a mission. That's a, that's a lot to be responsible for. Um, and, it, and now on top of that, we're in the midst of a public health emergency. Um, so how has that shaped the, the mission of the office at, at the current, and under COVID, with COVID-19? It has been nonstop work and incredibly important. And we, in the beginning, underestimated just how much uh, the American people depend on these laws during a crisis. That's when it really comes uh, front and center. And among all of our, our issues, so on conscious religious freedom, for example, we had to make sure that any guidance coming out of uh, HHS made sure that we weren't singling out religious worship for uh, suspicion or uh, additional restrictions compared to comparable secular activities. We want to keep everybody safe. We want to do it in an even-handed manner. And I think we've done so. We landed in a very good place. On the issue of health information privacy, people were not receiving health care in hospitals and clinics anymore, yet they were still, they still had the need for health care with the stay-at-home orders uh, people didn't magically become healthy. In some cases, they had more complications, equipment. I mean, people who had to receive dialysis, for example, which is important to your listeners, um, couldn't be going as frequently to, to get consultations, et cetera. So we, on, on the Office of Civil Rights, allowed for the use of very common telehealth apps beyond the normal standard commercial ones to include things like FaceTime and Skype that most people already have on their phones or on their computers. And we made sure that we would not be issuing civil monetary penalties for use of those common apps, uh, even though they may not have been fully HIPAA compliant. And we were flexible and adaptive, and now telehealth has exploded in a way that was 
never imagined before this crisis to make sure that people are served wherever they are and we wanted to make sure that we didn't have any impediments to that, at least during this crisis. I know there's a movement to increase the use of home dialysis and I believe telehealth can actually help to make sure that a patient has access to the doctor from home to be able to make sure that uh, they're getting the proper treatment even if they do it from a home-based setting. And providing options for people with kidney disease is, is really such an important step and we're hoping, hopeful that the telehealth option will be used with greater frequency to provide people those options. And finally, on the civil rights side, what would happen if they run out of resources during a crisis, particularly ventilators? And that question was not theoretical, it was real. Once the surge was happening in, in certain states, we examined state crisis standards of care plan and discovered to our dismay that several states had exclusion criteria, meaning you're either put at the end of the line or you get no treatment at all, for things such as, quote, profound mental retardation or long-term use of dialysis machines if you have any sort of renal disease or renal failure and you would be denied access to a ventilator. So we looked at these plans and said that they are actually contrary to law. You cannot have flat exclusion criteria based on disability as well as, as stark age cutoffs. And we've been so happy to see states respond and change their plans to come into compliance with the law. Well, there is a lot to unpack in what you just said. Um, so I think for our listeners, we want to start first and foremost with our uh, acknowledgement of appreciation in terms of the speed at which HHS moved on telehealth. Um, it was absolutely critical in this crisis, particularly for kidney patients, as you just acknowledged. You know, if you are currently receiving dialysis in center somewhere, um, you just don't have the option of sheltering in place and staying there. You can't. You have to receive your, your dialysis treatment. So um, it was amazing how fast the department moved and on such a broad scale on telehealth. Um, and our members know because they were one of the first approved telehealth uh, users several years ago. So and that's always been kind of unique in nephrology, and we were really appreciative of all the things that you guys did. About the time, I guess, you were learning about the, the crisis management policy shortly thereafter, our people were learning about it as well. And they were, there's just no doubt about it, they were stunned when they heard about it, and they were just outraged. Uh, and so, again, just as you did with things like the HIPAA compliance and so forth, you guys moved very quickly uh, on this particular issue. This was a sprint. It was the fastest I've seen the federal government move ever. And I've worked in the federal government for many years. And it just shows the uh, crisis level of urgency. And the president mobilized the entirety of the federal government. It was a full America, full federal government response to tackle this unprecedented crisis. And we've done our part by adding as many HIPAA flexibilities as we can to making sure we, we target the most urgent areas of need and the crisis standards of care were the most urgent. And thank God, we have not had to ration ventilators. However, we yep. still have these plans that are on the books, and we have to make sure that they're all compliant because this may not be the last crisis our country will face. This may not be the last crisis certain states or localities will face or even an individual hospital may face if they start running out of say, dialysis machine access or ventilator access. These are critical questions. So we have to make sure that our values as a nation, that we respect all human life and the equal dignity of every life is reflected in crisis standard of care plans. This is not simply a question of medicine. It never is simply a question of medicine. It's a question of philosophy, morality, and values, and of law. And we have to make sure that our principles of equal treatment under law, especially for persons with disability and older persons, are fully respected. And we could do that while still allowing states to have yeah. tremendous flexibility so they could prioritize their own prerogatives within the guardrails of the law. And that's what we've done, and that's what we continue to do. Well, I, I want to just stop you there for a second and say, are there any particular state examples that you could speak to that, uh, that you guys had to deal with very quickly? We have th three so far. Uh, Alabama, which had the exclusion criteria that I mentioned earlier, 
Pennsylvania had deprioritization of persons with disabilities. And most recently, we've reached an accord with the state of Connecticut. And this one's interesting because it's not a crisis centers of care per se, it's access for support personnel for persons with disability. And we had a very sad case of a 75 year old woman who had uh, kidney disease that actually led to an aneurysm and aphasia, which limits her ability to mm -hmm. communicate. And she really can only communicate well with designated persons or family members. Got COVID-19, was in a hospital, and was effectively on her own and could not communicate and was in extraordinary pain and very close to dying. Uh, and we worked with the state and helped mediate an agreement with the hospital as well. And now the state has recently issued an executive order that requires hospitals to allow admission of designated support persons for persons with disability. We do not want to be in a situation where people are dying alone and in part because they are not getting the support they need if they have a disability that needs that targeted support. So you could preserve safety during a pandemic while preserving the rights to e of equal treatment for persons with disabilities. So we're very happy with the actions we've taken and we commend the states who have been very uh, cooperative in fixing their plans and fixing their policies and Connecticut being the most recent. Uh, it's been a very good partnership between advocates and the states and the Office for Civil Rights. So the Connecticut situation, which is one that, that I know that a lot of our members are aware of, of, of those types of situations happening um, at times during this pandemic, um, that that's not, though, a national umbrella. Is that correct? You still have to work with every individual state, uh, or am I not reading this correctly? We, we have national laws. We have Section 1557 yeah. of the Affordable Care Act, Section 504 of the Rehab Act, and the AGE Act. Those are national laws, and if you receive federal funds from HHS, and these are usually hospitals and healthcare facilities, you have to comply with the law. And states often receive federal grants, and they often hand them down to subrecipients, and states have to comply as well. The law is national. However, we, we pursue our cases usually through complaints or compliance reviews in, of individual states, and we mm -hmm. work with states on an individual basis uh, to fix any problems. Now, we've done this multiple times, and states are starting to, on their own, fix their plans, and that's really what we want to see. We want to see self-compliance, voluntary compliance, so we move out of enforcement to technical assistance uh, and uh, states being able to see models, adopt them, and fix their plans, and that's what we're beginning to see, which is very encouraging. Thank you for clarifying that for us. Uh, that leads me to a question. If our listeners are seeing something that they think is the discriminatory or something that they think is questionable, um, where do they go? How do they approach this? The best way is to get educated on our laws and to file a complaint with the Office for Civil Rights. You could do it on our complaint portal, www.hhs.gov slash OCR. That is for Office for Civil Rights. File a complaint on our complaint portal, and that is the best way. And the cases I mentioned to you of Alabama, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut, they came from complaints from advocacy organizations. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be a lawyer. You could just be a person who feels their rights may have been violated. File a complaint. Let us worry about making sure that there's the funding streams that are connected to the law. But we want to vindicate people's rights. And that's what we're here for. We're here to serve, especially during a pandemic. The full panoply of rights are not suspended. In fact, they are more important than ever during a crisis such as this. You guys have had your hands full. It does sound like that. Um, kind of what else do you want our, our listeners to think about as, as they listen to this podcast? Uh, I think you always have to remember when there is a time of crisis, our values are tested. And we, it's always a test to see what is the American character. And I think you're seeing it shine through in neighbor helping neighbor, and you're seeing it in the federal government making sure that all of our, our rights are protected, especially for the most vulnerable. How we treat the most vulnerable in society is really a reflection of our character. And that's what our civil rights laws stand for, to make sure everybody's treated equally, to make sure that nobody is left behind, and we're focused like a laser beam on that issue whether it be 
uh, kidney disease or intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, age, exercise of religion, or conscience. These are a reflection of who we are as a people. I want to make sure that those rights are um, the ones that we respect as opposed to some sort of utilitarian calculus that weighs the value of one life versus another based on stereotypes or quality of life judgments, saying one life is worth living while another is not. That, that's not that's not who we are. And we're making sure that message comes through loud and clear as well through our enforcement actions and our assistance with the states. I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming on and and sharing this with our, our listeners. Um, I know our members, we're going to be getting the news out of this podcast in a lot of different ways because I know our members are very, very interested in this. Thank you very much for joining us. You're very welcome. This podcast is copyrighted by the American Society of Nephrology, all rights reserved. All content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be medical advice. This podcast should not be used in a medical emergency or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. Please consult your doctor or other qualified healthcare provider if you have any questions about any medical condition or before taking any drug changing your diet, or commencing or discontinuing any course of treatment. Thank you for listening to this podcast from the American Society of Nephrology.